I am just delighted to be here. Um, I like to sort of think of Florida as being my home, too. Um, I started school at Ponte Vedra Palm Valley Elementary outside of Jacksonville. Um, with my parents, we lived in Orlando and in Dunedin, north of Tampa. And I actually started my journalism career at the Boca Raton News. So I spent a lot of time in, times in different parts of this wonderful state. And I'm always delighted to be here. And I want to say congratulations to all of you for finding a way to stay. <laughs> not, not all of us are so fortunate. Um, now, I love what Betty said, asking how many people knew who Frances Perkins was. Now, this is not an idle question. It's really quite extraordinary that this woman, who has affected so many lives in America and around the world, is so little known. And in fact, just recently on a Jeopardy show, they asked the question, who was the woman behind the New Deal? And it was a really kind of a smart crew. You know, they were all pretty good with the answers. And it was the $2,000 question. And nobody knew the answer. Mm -hmm. Somebody finally said, oh, Eleanor Roosevelt. But that was not the answer. <laughs> the answer is Frances Perkins. Um, and in fact, um, I saw quite a few hands here when Betty asked how many of you knew who Frances Perkins was. So if we had $2,000 bills to hand out if we were in the Jeopardy show, I don't know if we'd be going home a lot richer tonight. Um, so let me ask you another question, too, to just sort of expand on this. How many of you know somebody who's ever gotten an FHA loan? Raise your hand. How many of you know anybody who's ever been on unemployment insurance? Raise your hand. How many of you know someone on Social Security? <laughs> How many of you know two people on Social Security? <laughs> okay. Well, this is a group then that should really know who Frances Perkins is because those are all programs that would not have happened except for Frances Perkins. Now, those of you who don't know who she is should not feel bad about that at all because the fact is, I had no idea who she was. And I remember the first time I heard her name, it was back in 1988. I'd been a reporter um, in Florida, then I'd gotten a job at the San Jose Mercury, and I was working out there, and then I got hired to the Washington Post. It was 1988, and I didn't know Washington at all. So I took that tour bus tour of the city. I bet a lot of you have taken that tour bus tour of Washington, D.C. You know the ones where you come out by Union Station, the railroad station, you go, it sort of loops around. You come out past this really huge building, and it's the Francis Perkins Department of Labor. Hmm. And I remember when we went past it, I thought, oh, Francis with an E. It's a building named after a woman. So rare. I thought, well, you know, this is a pretty unusual thing. I waited to hear what they were going to say. But they never mentioned it. We went on down around. You know how they have sort of like a comedy pattern kind of thing, a bunch of little jokes. And we finally got to the point where there's like some long blocks where you're over by the Washington Monument. You know, they, it's block and block and block and block and block. And that's where they really start to tell the jokes. And so they said, what American woman had the worst childbirth experience? <laughs> Frances Perkins. She spent 12 years in labor. <laughs> <laughs> now, the feminist part of me felt a little embarrassed that I always remembered that joke and that I laughed. Um, but it always made me remember her. And so over the next 20 years at the Washington Post, as one thing and another came up, and someone would mention, oh, you know, well, Frances Perkins was involved in that. Oh, you know, hey, uh, Frances Perkins was involved in that. Oh, did you know that Frances Perkins was involved in that? I began to see this really incredible pattern emerging, that there was one person who had been in the middle uh, of thing after thing after thing, things that had heralded huge improvements in the lives of Americans. I began to think that it was quite extraordinary that there was one person who had done so much that she was so little known, and I began to ask myself, how the heck did she do it? Because we all know, we've all seen in our lives how really hard it is to get progressive legislation passed. Um, even while we see really big problems right in front of us, we often have very difficult time finding ways to craft solutions, things that people can agree on. And I became more and more impressed by the breadth of what she'd accomplished. And when I started the book, and I guess that was about 12 years ago now, I thought I'd be writing a book about her as sort of the most effective woman, most effect one of the most effective progressive women in American history. And by the time I was done, after I learned all the things that she had done, I came away thinking she was probably the most effective progressive male or female in American history.
Um, and I'm going to start with just a short reading here. It's the prologue from the book, um, just because it'll give you a sense of the breadth of some of the things. I'm going to have to go through kind of quickly through all the things that she did, because it's just almost like giving you a laundry list um, of the things that she did. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how she did it, and I want to leave a lot of time for questions, because you'll all have, you know, as I go through this, you'll all have something that you go, what? And I want to give everybody a chance to ask those questions. Um, and, to, you know, that's often the most fun part of, the, of, a, of a talk anyway, isn't it? But let me start with this short reading. <coughs> On a chilly February night in 1933, a middle-aged woman waited expectantly to meet with her employer at his residence on East 65th Street in New York City. She clutched a scrap of paper with hastily written notes. Finally ushered into his study, the woman brushed aside her nervousness and spoke confidently. They bantered casually for a while as was their style. Then she turned serious, her dark luminous eyes holding his gaze. He wanted her to take an assignment but she decided she wouldn't accept it unless he allowed her to do it her own way. She held up the piece of paper in her hand and he motioned for her to continue. She ticked off the items. A 40-hour work week, a minimum wage, workers' compensation, unemployment compensation, a federal law banning child labor, direct federal aid for unemployment relief, social security, a revitalized public employment service, and national health insurance. <laughs> she watched his eyes to make sure he was paying attention and understood the implications of each demand. She braced for his response, knowing that he often chose political expediency over idealism and was capable of callousness, even of cruelty. The scope of her list was breathtaking. She was proposing a fundamental and radical restructuring of American society with enactment of historic social welfare and labor laws. To succeed, she would have to overcome opposition from the courts, from business, from conservatives, even from some labor unions. Nothing like this has ever been done before in the United States, she told him. You know that, don't you? The man sat across from her in his wheelchair, amid the clutter of boxes and rumpled rugs. Soon he would head to Washington, D.C. to be sworn in as the 32nd President of the United States. He would inherit the worst economic crisis in the nation's history. An era of rampant speculation had come to an end. The stock market had collapsed. Banks were shutting down, stripping people of their lifetime savings. About a third of workers were unemployed. Wages were falling. Hundreds of thousands were homeless. Real estate prices had plummeted, and millions of homeowners faced foreclosure. Any of that sound familiar? <laughs> His choice of labor secretary would be one of his most important early decisions. His nominee must understand economic and employment issues, but be equally effective as a coalition builder. He was a handsome man with aquiline features, and he studied the plain, matronly woman sitting before him. No one was more qualified for the job. She knew as much about labor law and administration as anyone in the country. He'd known her for more than 20 years, the last four in Albany where she had worked at his side. He trusted her and he knew she would never betray him. But placing a woman in the labor secretary's job would expose him to criticism and ridicule. Her list of proposals would stir heated opposition, even among his loyal supporters. The eight-hour day was a standard plank of the Socialist Party. Unemployment insurance seemed laughably improbable. Direct aid to the unemployed would threaten his campaign pledge of a balanced budget. Still, he said he would back her. It was a job she prepared for all her life, she had changed her name, her appearance, even her age to make herself a more effective labor advocate. She had studied how men think so she could better succeed in a man's world. She had spent decades building crucial alliances. Still, she told the president-elect that she needed time to make her decision. The next day, she visited her husband, a patient in a sanitarium. He was having a good day, and he understood when she told him about the job offer. His first impulse was to fret for himself, asking her how this new job might affect him. When she assured him that he could remain where he was and that her weekend visits would continue, he gave his permission. That night in bed, the woman cried in deep wailing sobs that frightened her teenage daughter. She knew the job would change her life forever. She would open herself to constant media scrutiny, harsh judgment from her peers, 
and public criticism for doing a job a woman had never done before. Yet she knew she must accept the offer. As her grandmother had told her, whenever a door opened to you, you had no choice but to walk through it. The next day, she called Franklin Roosevelt and accepted the offer. Frances Perkins would become the nation's first female Secretary of War. Well, we know what happened, don't we? The Social Security Act, passed in 1935, gave us unemployment insurance, it gave us Social Security, and it gave us the beginnings of our welfare system, which was aid to dependent children, which at that time was designed to help um, the wives and children of men who went off working, uh, went off looking for work, never found it, and never came home. The Fair Labor Standards Act passed in 1938. It said a 40-hour work week. It created a minimum wage. It led to a ban on child labor, and it called for the creation of the concept of overtime pay. Other things she did. She was a major supporter of the FHA insurance program that has helped millions of people in America buy houses. And in fact, this is one of the things that brought indoor plumbing and running water to most homes in America. And that's not all. She was the primary architect of the Civilian Conservation Corps, which put three million young men and women to work on national and state parks, creating tourism jobs in rural areas that have few options for economic development. And I understand you've recently heard about the CCC through a Venice Historical Society program that has pointed out how many uh, parks in the state benefit from CCC labor. And that's not all. Frances Perkins was the largest single supporter of the Works Progress Administration, another program that you've heard about recently, which was the mass, which created the massive public works projects that we all have come to rely on, the core infrastructure for America in the 50s as we grew and developed as a nation. And just a few of those would be the Lincoln Tunnel, the Blue Ridge Parkway, the East Bay Bridge between Oakland and San Francisco, and a big one for us here in Florida, the Highway of the Florida Keys. And that's not all. <laughs> the Immigration Department then was part of the Labor Department. And doesn't that really make a lot of sense? Because really, most immigration issues really are labor issues. And at that time, when Frances Perkins became Secretary of Labor, immigration was under the Labor Department. And Frances Perkins played a key role in bringing tens of thousands of immigrants to the United States to get them out of the hands of Nazis well before most Americans had any idea of the extent of the dangers that people were going to be facing in Europe. I don't, have the I don't have time to go into all the details here, but just suffice it to say, there would have been no movie, The Sound of Music, without Frances Perkins, because the Bond Rat family would have never been able to make it safely to the United States to safety, and ending up in that nice Vermont ski lodge where their story became so well known. And that's not all. <laughs> she also helped draft the first rule giving workers an explicit right to organize. And workers rushed to form unions um, in the 30s and 40s. In 1932, about 5% of the workforce was unionized. And we tend to forget that. Uh, we tend to think that labor is so down on its heels now. It's interesting to think that uh, in 1932, the rate of labor unionization was about half the rate that it is today. But by the time Frances Perkins died in 1965, a third of the workforce was unionized. And as we all know, that was one of the things that boosted many millions of people into the middle class in America. National health insurance? <laughs> it never happened. It was too controversial then. It remains very controversial today. At that time, the American Medical Association said they would kill Social Security to prevent what they called socialized medicine. FDR scuttled health insurance to save Social Security. And instead, we've ended up with a patchwork system that we have today that we continue to try to find ways to work with and improve, um, something that remains an issue in the news every single day. Well, that's quite a list of accomplishments, isn't it? And that's just in the years between when she was 52 to 59. Is that a real age? <laughs> Great question. Okay. She had remarkable accomplishments, really, from the time she was about 20 
until the time she was 85, which is when she died. Her career stretched from Teddy Roosevelt, who gave her her first important job, to the work she was doing shortly before her death for the Kennedy administration. Now, we can look back and say, my, she got a lot done, but it must have been easier then to get things done. You know, the lobbyists weren't so strong. The courts, they must have not been so hostile. Maybe the conservatives were easy to, easier to get along with back then. But no, actually, Frances Perkins did a lot of these things in times that were eerily parallel to our own. She was born in 1880, and like our times today, it was a time of rapid economic change. There were a lot of technological developments that were causing all kinds of seismic shifts in the workplace. There was a huge influx of immigration in the 1880s and the 1990s, and it stirred a lot of resentment. The gap between the rich and the poor was growing wider every day. At times in her childhood, economic conditions were so bad that many people actually lost their homes just as they have now. In fact, the prototypical, uh, prototypical image that we have of the haunted house of 1880, for example, the haunted house that we see at Disney World, was because of a huge rash of foreclosures that happened in about 1900. A lot of people lost their homes then because they couldn't afford to keep them anymore. So none of these issues are new. Now the role of women was changing very rapidly in Frances Perkins' life, just like it, like it is now. When she got her college degree from Mount Holyoke in 1902, only about 3% of American women went to college. And in fact, Frances Perkins never had the right to vote until she was 40 years old. <laughs> she and the women in her generation had to reinvent themselves. They had to imagine themselves in a new world. And I think we've all had to do that in our lifetimes as well, haven't we? So, as I said from an early age, Frances Perkins had to start to think about who she was, how she could be most effective in this changing world. And she began reinventing herself from a very young age. First, her name. Her real name was not Frances Perkins. Her real name was Fanny. Mm -hmm. Fanny Coralie Perkins. Now, she never explained why she changed her name. But obviously, a name that suggests a woman's rear end is a career disadvantage. <laughs> Now, why she picked the name Frances, she never really said either. Sometimes she'd say it was a family name, or sometimes she'd say she really liked monogrammed linens, and she thought if she kept the same initials, she could get monogrammed initials, uh, linens, and never have to change the letters. But it also had the advantage of being a gender-neutral name, <coughs> which she found was very helpful for her in getting ahead. Now, she also changed her political affiliation. In uh, her early 20s, and this is before she even had the right to vote, Frances was a member of the Socialist Party. But when she entered public life, she registered as a Democrat, and she later denied that she'd ever been a socialist at all. <laughs> Part of that was because she was very effective at cultivating the support and friendship of Republicans. She sought out Republicans of integrity and enlisted them in her plans. She sent them notes of congratulation when they got promoted or when they got elected. She sent kind notes of condolence when they lost a family member. She took speaking engagements in crowds where people did not agree with her viewpoint. She learned to talk to people from different backgrounds. She learned to convince them. She learned to use humor to make her points. In fact, she found that getting to people to laugh was the best way to convince them, even if they were not inclined to agree with your point of view. And I think one of the, some of the stories that are the most charming about Frances Perkins are what she did during the suffrage years. So for example, obviously Frances Perkins really wanted women to have the right to vote. So you know, in the suffrage movement, what would happen is women would go, there'd be two women, they'd go together in pairs. Um, they'd go to a street corner. Um, they found it was really good to, a cor to go to a street corner, a busy street corner, where there was a saloon on each, each of the four corners. Okay, the men would begin there drinking. The women would come in, they'd put a soapbox outside the corner. And one of them would stand up on the box and start to talk about the need for women to have the right to vote. Her friend would stand behind her, back, giving her back up, would hold up a banner that would say, votes for women, okay? Well, pretty soon, you know, men who are drinking want to come out and take a look at the woman standing on the box. And they'd come on out and they'd want to 
chuck some, some they'd want to watch. Sometimes they might throw some rotten produce. Some of them would be throwing jokes. Some of them might be a little insulting. Some might be a little, uh, a little off color. But usually there'd be somebody in the audience that had a sort of a sympathetic face. One of the men would be a gentleman, and he didn't like them talking that way to the ladies. So pretty soon Frances Perkins would pick that guy out of the crowd, and she'd say, um, my friend is really getting tired here. Could you help her with the banner? And the man had come out, and you know, he wants a gentleman. He wanted to help. He'd hold the side of the banner. And so here's her friend, and here's a gentleman standing behind her. After a while, she'd say, she'd pick another nice man in the crowd, and she'd say, you know, she's been out here an awful long time. Do you think you'd help? Pretty soon you'd have Frances Perkins on a soapbox explaining why women needed the right to vote, and she'd have two, mans, two men behind her holding up the banner. Okay? This is the kind of thing that Frances Perkins became very adept at doing because what she found is you turned a crowd around that way. From throwing produce and making mean jokes, they'd take the time to listen, and some gradually would be convinced, and eventually some would be convinced enough that they would vote for women to have, have the right to vote. Now, this whole thing of reaching out to people across the aisle was really a hallmark of Frances Perkins' life. And one of the ways that she did this was to um, think very consciously about how she was going to reach out to people. And so she would try very hard not to hate her political opponents. And that was hard sometimes because she often thought the people that were opposing what she was doing were selfish and short-sighted. So she was a very religious woman. She would pray for them. But sometimes it would just make her blood boil to even say their names. She'd be so mad that even in prayer she couldn't say their names. So she started to pay, pray for them in categories. For example, people who bear false witness. And she found that she could continue to pray for people who didn't always agree with what she was saying. Now she also had to invent a career track for her. You know, remember this in 1902 when she graduates. Um, there are very few permissible jobs for women, just teaching, uh, nursing, maybe briefly. Um, my grandmother wanted to be a nurse, and her parents said that was just much too shocking for a woman. Um, so there were very few permissible careers for women. And when she graduated from Mount Holyoke, she tried to get a job as a social worker. It was one of those economic downturns that were occurring. And she had a really hard time finding a job, so she finally got a job teaching at Ferry Hall, which is a women's college. Now, uh, some of you may know it's associated with Lake Forest in Illinois. But she was volunteering at Hull House on the weekends. And she would, in other words, do the work, the social work that she wanted to do while she found a paid job as a, as a teacher. She taught science <coughs> at Ferry Hall. Now, in her experience living and working in Chicago, she saw how bad labor conditions were. And she saw how bad things were in the meatpacking plants. She saw how pressured families were, how little leisure time they had. And she began to think about things that had to change to give them better lives. That working six days a week broke people physically. That having children start to work too young and in dangerous occupations led to them injuring themselves in ways that they could never make a good living and interfered with them getting an education that would allow them to make, a, make better pay in adulthood. She saw that workers who scraped by could be destroyed by even a brief period of unemployment if they lost their jobs and they had no savings. Now, these experiences that she had at Hull House were really pivotal. They sensitized her to a lot of social problems. And she learned to work then with uh, Jane Addams, the founder of Hull House, and a lot of you may, may know a lot more about uh, Jane Addams. That's a, a whole other topic, I'm just going to say that uh, Jane Addams came to think of Frances Perkins as their most important disciple at Hull House. But the fact was, is this volunteer work was all well and good, but she needed to support herself, like we all do. And she found that times were very bad. And in fact, people called that period the Panic of 1907. She moved to Philadelphia, where she heard there was a job. Um, it, was, uh, it was an opportunity. It was sort of a startup nonprofit. And they were uh, investigating sexual trafficking of young women. A lot of young women that were being brought up from the rural south, being offered jobs in factories, but instead were put into brothels. Um, and as we know, the, we continue to hear about issues of sexual trafficking even today. Now she had to raise the money to pay herself and the single employee that she was able to hire. 
She made so little money that she had to pawn the watch that her parents had given her pretty regularly to give herself food money to get through until she could get another <coughs> paycheck. This period of time, she got a fellowship to go to Columbia University. She got a master's degree. And she got a job with the National Consumers League investigating working conditions in New York City. Now, you see, this is finally, it took her, you know, some seven years from the time that she first hoped to get a job as a social worker in New York City till she finally got a position there. And so it happened that she was in New York City living and working there in 1911 when she had a shocking and life-changing experience. Now, this is another event that a lot of you may be well aware of, and that was that Frances Perkins was also a witness of the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire. Um, some of you may have seen the recent HBO special. Mm -hmm. This last year has been the 100th anniversary of the Triangle Fire. Um, and um, of course that fire was really pivotal in American history. Um, just briefly, you know, the, tri the Triangle Company made those pretty Gibson Girl blouses, those pretty frilly blouses. Um, they employed hundreds of immigrants in a factory um, that was on the uh, 8th, 9th, and 10th floors of a building in, in Lower Manhattan. The women were lined up shoulder to shoulder in there working on the sewing machines. Um, and because they um, had to work as quickly as possible, they kept um, squirting grease into the sewing machines to keep them lubricated, to keep them moving quickly. And also, they didn't take a lot of time getting rid of the, of the scraps of fabric, because that would be slowing you down. So they just pushed them into slots behind the back of their desks. So you had pe you know, oil, scraps of fabric, and sometimes at the end of the day, the foreman would start to light up a cigar and have a smoke. Well, obviously, this was very dangerous conditions. Um, these were things that, some of which were illegal, but many of which were not illegal. On a Saturday afternoon in March 1911, some uh, sparks fell on the oily cloth. A fire broke out. It exploded into flames. There weren't enough fire escapes. The elevator broke, and people started to jump to their deaths mm -hmm. out the windows. Frances Perkins was having tea on Washington Square that Saturday afternoon with friends. They heard, they heard the shouting and the screams. She ran across the park. She got to the base of the building just as the first bodies hit the ground. She stood there, and she watched 146 people either catapulted out to their deaths, where their charred bodies brought out. They took the bodies, they stacked them, they dragged them to a warehouse so their families could come and identify the remains. Now, many thousands of New Yorkers saw this terrible fire, but Frances Perkins became determined to do something about it. Now, remember, she's only 30 years old now at this point. She decided that regulations were needed to stop these kind of abuses from occurring. She was part of a group that formed to push for better workplace regulations. She quickly rose to the leader of the group uh, called the Committee on Safety. She was named for that job by Teddy Roosevelt, who had just stepped down from office and who was very concerned about the bad working conditions he had, he had discovered across America during his presidency. This was her first experience at running and administering a complete startup. And we can see how effective she was. Now, one of the problems was is that whenever you're going to do something that's going to be very controversial, you have to get allies, don't you? Now, the do-gooders who were her friends were naturally inclined to say things had to be done to improve working, condition, working conditions. But the, the people who owned a lot of the big office buildings said, this is going to be very expensive. We're already operating on a thin margin. You can't ask us to do this. So she had to look for other allies. It's part of the brilliance of Frances Perkins. She made some very good friends in the insurance industry who said, if we can prevent these fires, we can save a lot of money on insurance policies. And she also went to Tammany Hall, which was a really remarkable thing. Tammany Hall was a sort of a seedy political machine operating in New York. And they had never really been that interested in workplace safety. Um, but they, too, were horrified by the fire a number of the Tammany Hall legislators had, had lost <coughs> constituents in the fire, and they'd had to make the rounds to the families that were grieving. And they, too, were struck and horrified by what had happened. So Frances Perkins, a group of Tammany Hall people, 
and with some support of far-sighted business people, joined together and they created something called the New York State Vac Factory Investigating <coughs> Committee. And they began investigating problems and issues that related to workplace safety. Now, her friends, Al Smith and Robert Wagner, took key roles on those committees. In fact, these were two men who were so closely allied to the Tammany Hall political machine that they were in fact called the Tammany Twins at that time. But they were the people who helped her. Now in the first year, the commission that was directed behind the scenes by Francis submitted 15 bills to the legislature and eight became law. Smoking in factories, prohibited. Regular fire drills became mandatory. Sprinklers were required in buildings over stem stories tall. In the next year, 26 of 28 bills became law, including rules requiring fire escapes, improved building exits, and occupancy limits. Look around the room here. Francis Perkins handiwork is all around us. Sprinkler system, if a fire breaks out, there's the exit sign, we know where to run. There's a thing to pull to alert the fire company. And the fact is that when we leave at had snacks, um, someone will come and remove the flammable debris. This doesn't happen by magic. It happens because of the hard wisdom that came from knowing that that kind of flammable, flammable debris is what causes fires. Frances Perkins' ideas spread all over the country. She was the keynote speaker at the National Fire Prevention Association's annual conference in New York City. She urged the participants at that to take those lessons home and that's why we have things like all these things in Florida and Virginia and Iowa and Ohio and Indiana and Michigan. It's because those ideas spread all over the country and then all over the world. Now here's where she takes a little detour in her life. Frances Perkins got married. She had a baby and she quit working. Now she thought she'd be a homemaker and do some volunteer work on the side. But typically, even a volunteer job became something bigger for Frances Perkins. And she started something called the Maternity Center Association, which provided free maternal and infant care to babies in New York City. So you see this recurring interest that she has in health care and providing health care for people of all economic levels. And the centers became an international model for well baby clinics. The concept spread all over the world. And in fact, one of the things that's really interesting about Frances Perkins is that she considers what she did at the Maternity Center Association to actually have been her most important single piece of social work. But for Frances, however, tragedy now intervened on a lot of levels. I mentioned her husband in the sanitarium. Now she was very happily married, he was a charming, wonderful man, but he lost his job in 1918 and he spiraled into a very bad depression. It soon emerged that his depression wasn't temporary. He had developed bipolar disorder. He gambled away their money. He could no longer work. And then their daughter, Susanna, developed the same problems. Instead of being an at-home mother, Frances was forced to look for another way to make a living. Al Smith, her friend from Tammany Hall, ran for governor in 1918, and she campaigned for him. And at this point, she was desperate for jobs, so she was delighted when he named her to the State Industrial Commission. So Frances Perkins is 38 years old when she first went to work for the, for the government. Now the work that Frances Perkins and Al Smith did together was so notable that Smith became a presidential candidate, right? And he looked for someone to step into his place and hold the governorship and continue his policies in New York City, in New York State. And that was when he and Perkins called upon one Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Now Smith was defeated for president, but FDR was elected governor. And Francis joined his administration, and he made her his industrial commissioner, so he made her the head of the whole agency. And when he was elected president, he'd already known her for 20 years. And it was only natural that he would want her by his side in Washington. And that takes us back to the beginning of the talk that plan she laid out to FDR when he offered her the job as Secretary of Labor. And we see all the ways she had adapted herself, all the ways she prepared herself for the possibility of such a thing ever occurring in her life. She had changed her name, she had changed her appearance, 
And that's one of the things that I think is very fascinating about Francis Perkins. I'm going to walk through and show you something right now. Here's what Francis Perkins looked like as a young woman. Do you see how she had her hair on a fancy top knot? She loved those Gibson girl blouses. She liked pretty jewelry. They called her pretty, perky, pert. I've heard her, I saw her called dimpled. But at some point in her early 30s, she had the revelation that men found a certain kind of woman much more trustworthy than a really attractive woman. They really trusted women that looked like their mother. <laughs> and here we see how Frances Perkins transformed herself, took her thick hair, tied it all up, put a little hat on her head. She actually liked a tricorn hat. It sort of suggests a sort of a patriot image, too. Maybe never, no makeup, little pearls around her neck, simple clothing, dark suit. She had realized that men would trust her and tell her things if she looked like their mother. <laughs> now, here's another change she made. She changed her age. Now, that could have been female vanity, right? A lot of women wish to be younger. But by making herself two years younger, she made herself the same age as FDR. And I like to think that this is one of Frances Perkins' most fascinating pieces of emotional intelligence. Because anyone who's ever visited Match.com <laughs> knows that men think that women who are two years older than they are are much older. <laughs> and they only think that women who are their age or, young, or younger are actually their age. So I think that one of the ways that Frances Perkins had a great rapport with FDR was that even though she was two years older than he was, he always thought she was the same age as he was. <laughs> now, you can see that these are examples of ways that Frances Perkins engineered her life. And I think that that's part of the fascinating thing about Frances Perkins is her acute emotional intelligence and how she used it to chart a course for herself to deal with problems she had early identified in her life as serious social problems that as an American patriot she felt needed to be confronted. She applied her emotional intelligence to the world around her and found that she could make a difference. And her ability to do that had lasting good consequences. The good that she, done, uh, that, she, that she accomplished has outlasted her. The America that we have today, let's think of America today without Francis Perkins. 54 million people are on Social Security today. These last four years, what would have happened in America if Social Security hadn't existed? That's what happened during the Great Depression. The Great Depression was a terrible economic downturn without Social Security. We have had up to 10 million people on unemployment insurance at the, at the, at the lowest point of our last few years of terrible economic <coughs> downturn. There are about 6 million unemployment insurance today. Francis Perkins, in fact, created the shock absorber system that our country uses to get through economic downturns because we know we have those booms and we love those booms. Those are great times, but they're followed by the bus. And if you've got a system to help people get through those bus, people can make it through to the next boom. So Frances Perkins, in fact, did great service to us in just these last few years alone. And so we can say to ourselves, and I guess this was one of the key questions that I thought about over and over again as I wrote this book, is um, why did she do that? You know, why did she change her appearance? Why did she put herself in this hostile world? In fact, she found Washington to be just as painful and difficult as she feared it was, would, would be. Why did she do it? And I thought and thought and tried to wonder why. And I, at the end, I think this was the conclusion I came up with. There was one letter that really summed it up to me. Uh, Supreme Court Justice Felix Frankfurter wrote Frances Perkins a letter as she was stepping down as Secretary of Labor. He congratulated her on her successes and he acknowledged that she'd gotten horribly, horribly criticized for doing it. It was very painful. And she responded to him, 
I came to work for God, FDR, and the millions of forgotten, plain, common working men. The last conversation I had with FDR was of such a nature that I could say with the psalmist, my cup runneth over, and surely goodness and mercy shall follow me. And I say to Francis Perkins, Amen.